All right, welcome to our uh, New York Giants preservation meeting for tonight, which is September 27, 2023. Usually we meet on Thursdays. Today uh, we are meeting on uh, today's Wednesday. Our guest tonight is Thomas Brown Jr. Uh, Thomas contributed to the new Willie Mays book, Five Tools, and he wrote about Willie Mays night at Shea Stadium. And the reason why I asked Thomas to speak because it is uh, the 50th anniversary of that famous night, uh, which happened September 25th, yep. uh, 1973. Right. Uh, before we uh, get started, just some uh, housekeeping uh, information. Some of you were kind enough to uh, send donations for the Zoom, so thank you for that. Um, our YouTube has gone up to almost 150 subscribers. Uh, getting... We, that video I made regarding the nine living New York Giants pulled in a lot for some reason. I don't know, but uh, I was very happy about that. So if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Um, I would think within the next month, uh, you might be seeing me in a different location. I don't know how much longer this computer has, so I need to, I'm going to be buying a new one. So if you see me in another room, that, that'll be the reason. This one is not gone yet but when i buy a new one i'm going to need to set it up and stuff so just to keep you aware of that um our next meeting will be october 5th that is next um next thursday uh the first two meetings we're going to be celebrating uh shot heard around the world jeff finley will be speaking next week on bobby thompson and then the following week we'll be talking about uh, sal evars and the whole uh sign stealing scenario um friday will be uh hopefully a, a happy anniversary and a sad anniversary for some of you september 29th of course is the date of willie mays's astonishing the catch against vic Bortz. it is also the last game that the giants ever played at the polo grounds as the new york giants a very sad day where a little more than 11,000 people showed up uh, to see the Giants leave. But let's get on to a uh, happier note. And with that, uh, I welcome Thomas Brown to uh, the New York Giants Preservation Society. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Sure. The floor is yours. Can... Well, I'm, I'm assuming all of you are up in New York somewhere, but I don't know for sure. I'm in North Carolina, so I'm coming to you from North Carolina. We have a lot of people here from uh, California and San Francisco. Okay. We got Arizona. We are well, uh, a lot of people everywhere. New Jersey, we're good. Excellent. Are you in Charlotte? No, I live in Hillsborough, which is outside of Durham. So I'm a I'm a Mets fan, but I'm also a Durham Bulls fan. So I'm kind of right, keeping I'm keeping an eye kind of on the, the Durham Bulls tonight because if they win, they'll be the International League championship for champions for the third year in a row. And they'll have a, a chance to play for the triple A championship and win that for the third year in a row. Good luck. Yeah, so at least one of my, you know, at least one of my teams is winning. Well Mets won tonight. Uh, yeah, they play a second game. So it's it's probably starting. No, the first game just ended. It was 13 or 14 to 2. They, they're they playing like champions. I know. Too late, though. <laughs> it is. They have late. to win one more game to avoid 90 losses. So. I know. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, um, let me start with, you know, when Willie Mays returned to New York. You know, May 11th, 1972 was when the trade was made. And he returned to New York. Oh, did I? Hang on. Sorry about that. Uh, too many things going on here. Uh, he returned to New York in a trade for $50,000, and they traded Charlie Williams to the Giants. And it took some negotiation, because originally the Giants were looking for one of the Mets infielders, but the Mets weren't willing to give up one of their infielders. And finally... Aristonum was more willing to get rid of Willie Mays. 
And so they made the deal for, you know, the, the minor player and some cash, bringing, bringing Willie back. Um, and at the time, you know, Willie was excited. Donald M. Donald Grant was talking about how Willie was going to make a big contribution with the team. You know, I hope he's here for the rest of his career and things are going to go well. Willie, you know, he played in 69 games for the Mets that season, batted 267, came back in 73, and things didn't really go well for him. You know, he was injured most of 73. I mean, he suffered a lot of injuries. They were always, you know, the Mets staff were always, um, <clears throat> excuse me, dealing with his knees primarily. It seemed like every game before the game, they'd have to ice him down, drain fluid from his knees. Um, he eventually injured his right shoulder, making a catch in Montreal. And the last game that he played for the season came on September 9th. <laughs> you know, no one knew that at the time, but that was the last game. He last regular season game was on September 9th. At that point, when he kind of was hurt and stopped playing, you know, the press kind of began to talk about, well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with Willie? You know, what is he going to do? And why isn't he playing? And <clears throat> that was kind of a trigger for him. You know, he hadn't been used to people criticizing his playing. And all of a sudden now he's hurt and he's not playing. And so it kind of led him to make the decision that it's time for him to quit. You know, he worked, he talked to his agent, Sam Circus, and they came to a decision that this would be the last season. And um, at that point, he made, he went on, the, he made his official announcement on September 20th on the Today Show. He went on the Today Show in the morning, and that's when it, it was put out there to the world that he was retiring. And later that day, you know, he made an appearance at Shea Stadium in front of the reporters to talk about his retirement. And, you know, he told the reporters at the time that he only played in New York. He only played in 73 because he was in New York. And, you know, he said, New York fans love me. They showed me that, you know, New York, when they love you, they love you. I never considered myself a superstar. I just consider myself a complete player. And so, you know, he announced that he, he was going to retire. He was not, you know, the Mets were in the middle of a pennant race. And so there was a lot of talk about, you know, where would he fit in there? How is it, you know, was he hurting Yogi Berra, you know, keeping a player that could be playing on the, you know, on the roster. And, um, and so, you know, Berra was pretty quiet about things, but, you know, again, he was trying to figure out where is, where is Mays going to fit into all of this? And, you know, one of his teammates made shortly at Joe Black spoke to the press shortly after the announcement and said, you know, it appears that when Willie, who admittedly is aging and hurting and without his old skills retired, it took a load off Yogi and the, and the team. So, you know, anyway, at that point, basically the Mets in typical Mets fashion left, left the retirement left left Willie Mays day to Willie Mays to figure it out. They said it would be on September 25th, but they gave him really no help in terms of who would be there, what he, you know, what he might say, et cetera, et cetera. It was left to him to organize the event. And he ended up renting a room in a hotel at the Roosevelt hotel in New York. And, work through who would be there, who he might invite with his agent, you know. One of the things he expressed it, you know, at the time as he started talking to people in in was that he wanted his wife to get a fur coat as part of, you know, as a gift for all that she did to support him. And the American fur industry said, come on down, we'll give you a fur coat for her. And he got and he picked one out for her. Um, at that point, you know, the Mets were 
on a roll with Mays wasn't playing. Willie Mays night came in the midst of, a, of the Mets at the time, September 20th, they had won 17 of 23 games that month and had gone all the way up from fifth place to first place. So not only was there Willie Mays knife, there was also a lot of excitement about would the Met, would the Mets make the playoffs again? You know, attendance was announced at 43,000, but most of the press, several articles in the press talked about how there was over 53,000 fans there that night. Probably many of them just standing <laughs> around, you know, but if you look at the, uh, the news articles, you know, several of the news articles talked about 53, 54,000 fans there. I mean, earlier that day, Mayor Lindsay had declared September 25th to be Willie Mays Day in the city. And as, pan as fans came into the stadium on the old Shea Stadium scoreboard, all they saw was 24, you know, and then as they came in, I don't know if you remember back in the day, lots and lots of banners would show up at Shea Stadium all the time. And fans would come in with all sorts of banners, you know, one of them, a giant among, let me find my, A giant, a, among, a giant among Mets. <laughs> Another one said, we who are about to who are about to cry salute you. Another said, bye, Willie. We hate to see you go. Another one said, thanks for the excitement through the years. Okay. One even read just Shalom, which seems appropriate for New York too. Um, but, you know, he was surrounded by fans just, they were there, you know, as Don Drum wrote in the New York, in the White Plains Journal News, Willie Mays is so much a part of New York that the fans who gathered to shower him with gifts and hear his farewell speech that night don't think of him as a giant anymore. You know, they had, they had accepted him as a New York Met by that time. Um, again, when finally around eight o'clock, kind of late, as people were crowding into the stadium, Lindsey Nelson, one of the Mets play-by-play -play announcer at the time, their first Mets, one of the first announcers for the Mets, he was the MC for the evening event. And again, Mays came out of the dugout, and there was all of these gifts around home plate, as well as, you know, numerous luminaries from the baseball world. I mean, Mays was showered. Mays was showered with gifts. Okay, I'll give you a list of some of the things that he received. Two limousines. He received a Mercedes Benz from Horace Stoneham. Wow. A hundred record albums. A lifetime supply of Atlantic records. Lifetime supplies of Teacher's Scotch, as well as a lifetime supply of Moet Champagne, a set of luggage a Fisher console stereo system, a private telephone system, a collection of Willie Mays dolls and games, bed sheets, towels, spreadsheets, clothing, a silver tray, a trip around the world for him and his wife, a trip to Mexico for both of them, as well as a typewriter and a watch for his wife. And finally, an honorary doctorate from Miles College down in Alabama where he grew up. So with all of those things, were given to him that night. And again, teammates were there, okay? Rivals were there, Pee Wee Reese was there, Duke Snyder was there, Bobby Thompson and Dusty Rhodes were there. Larry Doby was there along with Joe Black. Both of them played with him in the uh, Negro Leagues. Joe DiMaggio and Stan Musial were there. And again, Pee Wee Reese, was commented in one of the articles, you know, about Duke Snyder was also talked about. He also was quoted in one of the articles saying, I hated to see him come to bat. I hated to see him get on base. And it was a tragedy when we hit one to him. That's what Duke Snyder had to say. Pee Wee Reese, again, had a story. I'll never forget the time they were runners on second and third. First base was open and Willie was at the plate. Dixie Howe was catching because Ray, Ray Campanella was injured. 
Hal suggested to Walt Alston that we pitch to Mays in a, me in a meeting at the dugout. Before Walt got back to the dugout, Willie had hit the ball out of the ballpark. So again, there was lots of them that had quotes. Okay. One of the things that was mentioned earlier that on earlier that day on, on Willie May's day was it came out in an article on September 25th in the New York Times that I thought was interesting. It was a by Arthur Daly, who wrote at the time the sports of the times. And he talked about Willie Mays and a number of other players. And one of the things that struck me in that article was if Willie's, you see, writes here, if Willie's farewell address the other day lacked historical significance of the one that George Washington, another great man, delivered two centuries ago, it contained one exceptionally tr intriguing item. The amazing maze didn't dwell on the point, but only made but made only casual mention of the fact that he probably lost 75 home runs from his career total as a result of his two years in the army. Add that, and he wrote on later, you know, add that missing 75 home runs to the 660 and he would have had 735. And so I just thought that was interesting, you know. I mean, we you don't hear much about Mays' two years and how it impacted his career, you know, you hear about Ted Williams and all those other players um, who played during World War II or didn't play during World War II, but you don't you, you don't hear that mentioned too much about you know what that could have done for Willie Mays' career if he had had those two years back in his career, you know, to play. So I thought that was pretty interesting that he that even Mays was thinking, well, I might have made it or I might have gotten those home runs if I hadn't served, you know hadn't done my duty and served my time. Again, once all of the hoopla was done, once all the cele 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 celebration was done, it was actually finally time for Mays to step up to the plate and talk to the crowd. And some of you, probably many of you, you know, you can see his, his little speech, if you want to call it that, it's, I kind of hesitate to call it a speech because it was like one minute in length. Um, but you can find it on YouTube if you want. But, you know, I'm just going to read you, read you to it just to hear, as he, as he wrote, as he said, just to hear you cheer like this for me and not be able to do anything about it makes me a very sad man. I hope that with my farewell tonight, you would understand what I am going through right now. I never felt like I would ever quit baseball. But as you know, it always comes a time for someone to get out. And then he referred to the players. And I look at the kids over here and the way they are playing and the way that they are fighting for themselves tells me one thing. Willie, say goodbye to America. Thank you very much. And if you watch the video, you'll see that he's he's crying. He's hugging his wife. And then he tips his cap to the crowd. You know, and at that point, crowd, you know, was on their feet. I mean, six, seven minutes it went by before, you know, that before things settled down again. I mean, at that point, Mays walked back to the dugout, you know, and he he figured that that was actually his last time in a uniform, his last time on the playing field. He he kind of figured that he was retired at that point. You know, I mean, you know, his son was there, his wife was there. What more, what more was there to say? What more was there to do? You know, I mean, but he walked back to the dugout and as he did, um, at the time, the Mets had an organist, Jane Jarvis. Some of you may remember her. <laughs> you know, I do, growing up in New York, going to the games at Shea. And she played as, as he left, all Lang Syme, you know, as he walked over the field and gave her a rendition of it, you know. Um, one of, later on, you know, met Cleon Jones, who was the Mets left fielder at the time. He was also from Alabama, for those of you who don't know. No. But he wrote, 
I felt I wanted to cry. I know how Willie must have felt to say he can't perform anymore. It got to me. I think I might have dropped one or two tears. It was one of those times when you cry inside. And again, at that point, it was around 835 and it was time to play the baseball game. And I'll just give you a quick rundown, but you know, the Mets were again playing Montreal. They were in the pennant race at this point. Their one of their aces, Jerry Kuzman, took the mound. He had he had been pitching well, you know. He was four and one in September. And he was he was going up against Steve Rogers. Some of you may may know him, who was pitching for Montreal. He was a rookie that year, came in second in the, the rookie of the year voting in 1973. And again, the Mets took a, a quick lead, one nothing with a Bud Harrelson single. Kuzman moved him forward. Wayne Garrett singled, put him to put runners at the corner, and Felix Mian then brought him home. Montreal tied it, okay, on a throwing error by Wayne Garrett. And then, you know, <laughs> Leon Jones put the Mets ahead, okay, later on when he hit a solo home run. And he was asked about that home run later. And he asked, you know, whether Mays, again, both being from Alabama, was one of his childhood heroes when he was a when he was growing up in Mobile. He said, when you were playing as a kid, did they were he was asked, when you played as a kid, did you pretend you were Willie Mays? And Jones replied that he followed primarily Mobile native Hank Aaron a little more closely. But he said, it depended on if I got to a ball game early or late. If I got there late, somebody else was Mays and I had to be somebody else. Anyway, Kuzman hung in there till the seventh. And then Cleon Jones, he played a big role in this game. You know, I guess it was something to do with Alabama boys. And Cleon Jones kind of saved the game for the Mets. He, he made a running catch, perhaps thinking of Willie Mays, but he made a running catch with his arm fully extended in order to get a, to catch a Philippe Lou fly ball and probably prevent the, the, the Expos from tying the game. And so, you know, again, maybe, maybe he was, you know, thinking of or emoting Cleon Jones there. The end of the game was a couple of fame, you know, famous relievers, Tug McGraw relieved, um, Kuzman, you know, that was the year Tug McGraw coined, you got to believe. And so he was the Mets closer. He came in and did the job. And after they pulled out Rogers, Mike Marshall came in to try to see if, you know, he, he kept the, he kept the Mets from scoring, but the, the Expos couldn't. I mean, that was, well, that was the year Marshall had 92 saves one year before he set the record with 104 games or appearances. So anyway, the Mets, Whoops. The Mets ended up winning the game two to one. And at that point, you know, like I said, Mays thought he would be done. He told Joan Payson that he was planning to go to back to California. And she asked him again, she said, I need you to stay. Oh, I want you to stay. And so he stayed through the rest of the season because of her request. He didn't play in the regular season. But he ended up playing um, several times. I'm trying to think. He played, he got in one game against the Reds. Okay. And he actually played, a, he played an interesting role in the, in the championship series against the Reds. That was the year the Mets and the Reds played. And that was the year of the famous time that Pete Rose slid in the second and took out Bud Harrelson and Little tiny Bud Harrelson got up and was ready to throw fists at Pete Rose, but you know, was a little lopsided matchup. Well, anyway, at that point, that was at Shea. All the fans, when Rose went out to play center field at the end of at the when they took the field, fans kept throwing things at him, bottles, cans, everything. And finally, he he walked off the field and Sparky Anderson you know, talked to the umpires and said, he's not putting his players out there unless, you know, it would, they would, they would be safe. 
you know. And at that point, the umpires, as well as National League um, President Chubb Feeney, went over to uh, Yogi Berra and and said, "What are we going to do? We need some, you know. We need who can you put out there to calm the crowd?" And so Berra asked Mays to go out, and Mays walked out of the dugout, and when he did, the whole stadium just started cheering for him. And when he did, he walked over. You know, as he walked out to the outfield where all the, the rowdiness was happening, he held up a peace sign to the fans and he pointed to the scoreboard and reminded and, and indicated to show them that the Mets were ahead, you know. And then he went down, he walked down the foul line along with, at that point, he had been joined by Rusty Staub, Tom Seaver, and Cleon Jones. And he told the fans, we're ahead, we're ahead. We need to play the game and things settle down. And so he played, you know, he was a, who knows, you know, Mets fans can be a bit rambunctious. So who knows what would have happened if, you know, would they have forfeited the game? Would they, you know, may settle, settle them down enough to allow them, you know, allow the game to continue. The Mets won the game, won the series, but he, he did play in one game in, in the world series. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Played in three games and drove in a, a run in the series that they lost to the A's. My my fault. And again, at that point, you know, he was finished. That was he was retired. And Joan Payson had made a promise to him that that she would retire his number if he came back. Unfortunately, you know, she died a few years later before it ever happened and none of the you know future Mets owners for a long time the Mets owners didn't do anything to celebrate their past I mean there were like no retired numbers you know they even dropped off old timers day after a while you know most of the celebrations disappeared you know at the after Joan Payson died and for all those years Willie Mays never had his number retired. And finally, you know, when Steve Cohen took over, he wanted to start bringing back some of that stuff. And, and he made the decision that he would retire her number, which he did last year. Okay. Um, and at that point, they retired number 24. Mays did not make it. His son, Michael, made it. And, and, you know, his son, Michael, said at the time, Mrs. Payson and my dad had such an amazing relationship. Her promises to him were important. So to come to fruition like this, something undone is done. And at that point, they retired his number. And he was he was the seventh player, Mets player to wear number 24. Seven of them played it. Six of them wore it before he got there. Jim Bochamp was playing with the Mets and had to give it up when they traded for, for Mays. Kelvin Torve wore 24 briefly in, 2000, in 1990 for 10 days. And the fans and the, and the press gave him a hard time for wearing 24, so he dropped it after 10 days of playing, wearing it. Ricky Henderson wore 24 on his two stints with the Mets. And Robinson Cano was the last player to wear 24 before they were. So, you know, Willie Mays' number is now up there at City Field, along with all the other retired retired numbers of Mets, famous Mets. Anyway, that's that was Willie Mays' night. It was, I was not there. I, you know, I wish I was. <laughs> I was in high school at the time, so I did not make it there. I mean, I remember my my mom talking about it because my mom was a Giants fan and my dad was a Dodgers fan. So, you know, they always talked about how they could never agree on who the best players were. My mom always believed Willie Mays was the best, you know. Anyway, if anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Um, Tom, thank you so much for... Uh reliving a moment that really took place just yeah. about 50 years ago i know today almost so great presentation 
I got two quick questions for you. Sure. What made you write the article, first of all? Is it because you're a Met fan or, or whatever? The well, probably a combination of two things. Yeah, part of it was probably because I'm a Met fan. But um, I write, you know, I've been um, I've been a member of Sabre for a long time. I actually joined Sabre when I took my wife to Cooperstown on her honeymoon. <laughs> and I never did anything with Sabre because at that point I was starting my married life and raising my son. But I retired in 2016 and I decided I always wanted to write. So I started writing for Sabre. And whenever opportunities come up, I will, you know, if there's a book like the Willie Mays book, I'll always inquire, what can I, what can I write? And I think that that story was one that was available in there. So I just jumped at it because the combination of being at Shea Stadium, being Willie Mays, you know, was one that would interest me. And so, you know, I'm always, like I said, I'm always looking for new, most of my stories about the Mets. Right now I'm actually writing uh, or cleaning up or finishing a story about Candlestick Park, the the last game of the 89 series, when after they had the earthquake, the game after the earthquake, I had written about that. Um, and I'm, I've been asked to expand it into into a longer story for a book that's coming out about Candlestick Park. So, you know, we look forward to hearing that. So, yeah, I don't know when it's coming out. I just know that I've I've written most of what I need to write. I've got to I've got to add a little bit more to it. But we have a lot of people to ask questions, but I'm going to sure. cut the line a little. And Renee, you're going to speak because you're the emotional one. So let them have it. You're killing me with that one. I didn't expect this. Uh, you know, my mom was a Giants fan as well and was a huge uh, Monty Irvin and Willie Mays fan. So as a kid growing up playing, you know, I used to hear stories and stuff. And, yeah, you know, we heard stories of people's in the factory, you know, Dodger and Giant fans and Willie and, and, and Duke. And so um, – Watching him when he was in San Francisco was difficult. Uh, you know, game of the week, you know, I was all into right. that. And, you know, uh, when they came to play at Shea, I was into that, obviously, sure. and watching him play. So when that trade happened, I, you know, I had weeks weeks before that, I bought tickets for my mom for Mother's Day. It was a Mother's Day game. So when that trade happened, I was like, I, I, I was – <laughs> I lost it. I was like, oh, my God. To see him at the home run, wow. To see him on TV, wow. Know. You know, so, you know, uh, on his speech when he made, uh, you know, his farewell speech when he said he finished the year in 72 with batting 211, you know, what the fans cheered. I remember I didn't care. We right. got him. He's right. more than that. He's more than that. So, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, I, I, stayed home, I, I stayed home that night to watch that game, to, to, okay. to listen to that speech. And, you know, I'm I, I, very emotional as I've gotten older with, uh, you know, w w stuff that you watch when you were a kid, all of a sudden mm -hmm. comes back to you. You know, you go like, wow, I remember this. I remember that. And yeah. So, uh, so your insight more into this really got me losing it. And you know what, be, be honest with you, you know, like I, I'm a kind of a nut. When it comes to opening day and, you know, get okay. out all the videos and all that stuff. And, you know, uh, a matter of fact, that day, the 25th, I, you know, what my wife was working and stuff like that, because I know she would have said, oh, my God, here we go again. I played that <laughs> that Willie Mae speech and I was like, right. losing it. I lost it, you know, and I lost it on the, on that Mets uh, uh, old timers day. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm watching it. I'm like, oh, you're a Met fan. So I, I mean, I watched the Mets. And so I'm going like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then when they made the announcement, I was right. like, I cried a river. I was like, oh, my God. Finally, finally, finally. I mean, I was telling Gary, we got to get somebody. We got to get this happening. Why is this happening all these years? So when it finally happened, I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, so I. I, I thank you for, for uh, adding more insight. And, you know, the World Series, you know, don't get me started with that. I mean, he was, it, it, you know, he could have caught it. It's a son. There was a lot of, 
I a know. lot of outfielders had issues, so he's not the only one. Plus, he retired. I forgot how many years ago he showed up to an old timers game and caught a fat ball in the outfield right. at Shea. You know, I, I always bring oh, that yeah, up. Oh yeah, you're right. But but you know, uh, uh, thank you, thank you. I mean, he's he's my idol, and uh, I, I I'm I'm proud to 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 have this group and and love for for the, for this man, you know, and the kind of player he was. So thank you, I appreciate sure. it. Sure, he's well, he's. You know, like I said, my I, my I miss the polo ground. I never saw them, but you know, my mom told me about my my grandfather drove it. He owned a taxi in the you know back in the day when people owned their own taxi, and he would drive my my mom and my grandmother to the polo grounds and give them a quarter to go in and buy a hot dog. <laughs> he said that's what my mom told me. It's funny I, you say that because my mom took me. I was very very young. When the Giants came to town, she took me and you know to the game. You know, yeah. I have no recollection of that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure, Thank you, Renee. You know, the one thing, uh, Tom, that I take out. You know, we've seen Willie Mays age, of course, over 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 the fifty years, of course. Yeah. But that video that I'll show later, you know, you see Michael Mays as a young cadet. Right. You see him at Old Timers Day receiving, you know, the. Uh, accolades for his father because you know willie couldn't be there as a grown right. you know, as a grown man you know in his 60s probably so anyway we're gonna go to steve then mars then harvey then howard sure. steve you're up great presentation you know thanks to gary the last couple of months we've had so many different speakers about willie mays but this really brings back a lot of memories and like you said gary michael was at that uh, retirement dressed up as a as a young cadet <laughs> Right. He was there with he, his mom. And, he went and, to. He was at at the time. He was at LaSalle Military Academy. I was going to ask you: Is it LaSalle Military yep. Academy? Okay. And then you talk briefly about um, his his the, during the Cincinnati series. I I could be wrong, but I I think I remember Vince Scully saying, "And Yogi's pulled a rabbit out of the hat." Yeah. And they came up to pinch hit, and he took a wild swing. But like Scully said. A forty-foot single, and it was <laughs> and it was a key a key play in that. And then to go out and to get the whole crowd to stop throwing things. Right. This is New York. I mean, it, I it was so iconic. And I, Renee, I'm sorry you brought up the World Series. And yeah, listen, forty-two years old. It was sun, all of that stuff. He tripped. It was wet. That's not what what you want to remember. Um, no. And listen, he's, you know, I, I, I tried to print it here. I don't think it came out. The Hall of Fame um, president and Jane Forbes Clark just visited Carl Erskine mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago, and they brought the Buck O'Neill Award to Carl Erskine, right. who's going to be 97 in December. He's the last Dodger from 1951. And Willie Mays is the last giant from 1951. I mean, I could go on forever. I don't want to do that. Thank you so much for your presentation. I've read the book. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Mars, you are up. Well, thank you for uh, a beautiful presentation. Brought back a lot of memories. I have uh, a comment and then a question. Uh, sure. My comment is uh, the 1962 Mets in the inaugural year of the Polo Grounds drew over uh, 1 million people. I think they outdrew the Yankees. But over 700,000 of those fans came to watch the Giants and the Dodgers play at the Polo Grounds. <laughs> so uh, that's <laughs> how much New York fans miss those old teams. Right. The question I have is uh, when Yogi Berra did not pinch hit Willie Mays in the 73 World Series, I don't recollect any severe criticism by any sports writers? Do you have any documentation on that? You know, I wrote about several of those games and nothing, nothing that I remember stood out that, you know, they were anything severe. Just some of it was just, you know, commenting on his age, but not anything like he shouldn't have been there. You know, there was nothing that I remember, Stan, that stood out in terms of, like, really bad criticism of him. Well, you know, they were bickering 
uh, it was about Yogi's jealousy about Mays' privileges that year. Yeah, well, I think I think the bigger issue was, you know, Mays was kept on. I mean, I don't know. I think the bigger issue was Mays was on the roster and Mays couldn't play. And when they were in fifth place, it didn't matter. You know, I mean, when they went to first place, then there was more and more press about what what is, you know, what, what's Yogi going to do? You know, he needs they're winning. And Mays is, you know, Mays is making it perhaps harder for him to win. In, you know, some of the press was writing because he's back of a letter, lack of a better word, dead weight on, you know, on the roster. And so that's where, you know, some of the, some of the press was like, it took a, it took a little bit of the pressure off of Vera because now it, you know, everybody knew that Mays was not going to, you know, he was retiring, that he was going. But I think that's where a lot of it was. I don't, I don't know. It was privilege. It was more going from fifth to first. And what are we going to do with the guy that's on the bench all the time? He's hurt, but we need to keep him there. You know, the fans want him there, even though he's not playing. So I don't know if that really answered your question, but. Well, uh, you know, apparently, uh, I've never heard of any severe criticism, but then again, it was a long time ago. Sure. You know, but I, I all I could say, what most of us do believe, that who would you rather have up there in that clutch moment, with one of the greatest clutch players of all time, even yeah. at that age? Right. Right. Thank you no, for I your presentation. Sure. Mr. Weinberg, you are up. Tom, thank you for that presentation. It was wonderful. It brings back memories. I have no, I was at Willie's farewell. Really? Excellent. Um, I had mentioned it before we went on uh, the Zoom. Uh, I got tickets. Uh, I was working and I got tickets for my father and my brother. My father had been a Giants fan. He kind of drifted away from the Giants when they moved to San Francisco but I didn't. Uh, we were seated in the lower area of Shea Stadium behind home plate. I bought the tickets. I don't know how far in advance. Um, and uh, I have somewhere, if I ever get a chance to delve into, and I, I'm not kidding, I probably have a million slides and I took a roll that night wow. of, of, uh, of Willie's farewell. I have no recollection of the game. I don't even know if I took photographs of the game. I wasn't there for the game. Um, I was there for Willie. You mentioned Willie in the Army, and he would have hit more home runs. Um, I grew up in the Bronx, where, and I was part of the great debate. I saw Willie the first time. I was eight years and 10 months old on July 10th, 1954. So I was surrounded by Yankees fans and one Dodgers fan. Um <laughs> And uh, so the debate with the Yankees fans grew. And as I got older, I still debated with Yankees fans. And they would always decry the fact that Mickey Mantle, who was a great ball player, right. um, if he didn't have the bad knees, he would have hit X number of home runs. I said, my fallback wasn't a fallback. It was a discussion. Well, he served two years in the military. Right. And, and uh, I, I estimated that he would have hit 80 home runs, 40 and 40. Um, you could take your pick. He might have hit 50. Who knows? Uh, 50 and 50. Um, um, the the uh, the discussion of Willie getting traded to the Mets. I purchased tickets well in advance of that Friday night game. It was a Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon. But I I got Friday Friday's game. Um, I got the tickets for. Uh, Helen, my wife, and two dear friends, Kevin and Jeannie Keaton. Kevin was a Phillies fan, and I I bought the tickets so far in advance. Who knew that Willie was going to appear right. that night in a Mets uniform? And we were seated on the third base side in the mezzanine. I had a good view of the Mets. Though. I wanted to see, be seated on the Giants' side of the field. But who knew that Willie was going to come out of the dugout? He did. I recall him doffing his cap and... Kevin looked at me when Willie came out of the dugout. I think he was ready to give me some 
cardiac, uh, you know, respiratory help. But I, it was Willie in a Mets uniform. Right. And Sunday, um, Renee, thanks. I, I thought Sunday was uh, that Sunday was Mother's Day because Helen and I went over to uh, Helen's mom's home to celebrate Mother's Day. Um, but I but before we left, I saw Willie's home run. And I think I put a hole in the ceiling. It, 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 my loyalties to the Giants were not there that day when Willie hit the home run. <laughs> um, uh, just a couple of other things. Um, it, we had at this group, we had Carl Erskine. I think it's about 20 months ago. And Mars asked Carl Erskine a great question. Uh, he was talking about, you know, Willie was on deck when Bobby hit the home run. Mm -hmm. And Mars asked Carl, don't you think they should have pitched to the rookie? <laughs> <laughs> and Carl Erskine said, I remember his opening lines. He, he, Carl appeared, it didn't appear. He couldn't negotiate the, uh, the actual video, but he, he was on the phone. His voice changed. And he, it, you could tell how serious he got. And his opening line was, that would have been ill-advised. And then he discussed how he, how great Willie Mays, the rookie, yeah, yeah, the rookie, right, right. was. Um, so um, uh, uh, I will stop here because I can go on forever. Uh, I have no problem um in in saying that Willie was the greatest player I ever saw to this day, with due respect for Shohei, who's a great ball player, and Barry was a great ball player, and there was a lot of great ball players, but Willie is just a little better than all of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. you. sure. Absolutely. All right. Big Matt fan. Howard, you are up. Hey, Tom. Very good presentation. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, and I grew up in a family of New York Giant fans. My my father used to cut school to see Carl Hubble pl a pitch at the Polo Grounds. So, so we go okay. back to 1930 something. Now I wasn't at Willie Mays night because I was away at college upstate, but my brother was there. My older brother, he was a beat reporter for the Morristown Daily Record, covered the Mets that year, mm -hmm. and then he covered he had covered the Knicks in the spring when they won the NBA the championship. Title. Yep. So he told me he was in the clubhouse after the game and it was the most emotional night of his of his life, really, because he loved Willie Mays growing up as a kid throughout the 1950s. And we remained Giant fans when they moved to San Francisco, even when the Mets first started. And I eventually gravitated to the Mets. And once Willie came to the Mets, the Giants were history. But he said it was just amazing being in that clubhouse afterwards. I guess they had food, they had something going on. But uh, although I'm not 100 percent sure of that. Right. But he, he was there and uh, it was absolutely an amazing night for him. Now, later on in the playoffs, people may forget that Willie actually drove in the go ahead run in the fifth game against Cincinnati. It was an infield mm -hmm. hit, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he had the great game offensively in uh, out in Oakland game two. Right. And game Now, game three, he was a pinch hitter and he struck out. And that was his last ever played appearance. Do you know if that was Willie's decision or was that Yogi's to bench him? Because in the last game, the seventh game, the last out was made by a pinch hitter. I think he was a pinch hitter. I'm not sure. Rusty Staub, who had a very bad injury earlier in that series. He crashed into the wall at Shea. You're right. He was hurt. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, he was hurt, but he came up. I think it was either Rusty or maybe Wayne Garrett. I don't know. Some Garrett, Garrett. It Garrett. was Garrett. But yeah. was Willie at all available to make that one magical moment with two outs in the ninth inning and uh, whatever inning it was in uh, game seven out in uh, Oakland. You know, I don't know, but I'm guessing he was, but why he wasn't used. I don't know. You know, I mean, I don't know for sure. But he didn't play beyond game three. I mean, that was it. Yeah, that last right. appearance. That was it. You're right. I don't know if it was his decision or Barra's decision. You know, it's, it's hard to say. I never read anything that said, Otherwise, you know, one way or the other, I guess I'm saying. I suspect it, it was Yogi's because, you know, we, we've talked in the past about the little problem right, he had right. with Willie. Willie would have given his, his right arm or his left arm. He was a righty, of course, to go out there and, and maybe, you know, lightning striking, you know, I Correct. mean, uh, Hail Mary kind of thing. Correct. But he just sat on the bench. 
And the next day, the New York Post, uh, recapping the World Series, had uh, in Game Seven had just a one column uh, article that it was Willie's finale. It was very a low key. I mean, you couldn't okay. replicate what had happened, you know, at Willie Mays night. Right. But it was such a bland way of ending. It yeah, was a of like one column. You know, story. I don't. I don't remember seeing the New York Times because I was away at school. I didn't have access to the Times, but the Post I subscribed to, and I got it a day late, and I read just one, one article, one paragraph. Well, it was one paragraph. It was one, one column. Willie's farewell, and they didn't make a big deal about it, and it was almost like a relief that it was over. He was done. Yeah, I mean, it probably got lost in the in the World Series hoopla. Unfortunately, whether you know, I'm not saying it should have, but you know. Well, the Mets lost, of course, so football well, dominated the sports. Well, I'm just saying that, you know, been. that probably may have led to some of it, you know, whereas, but I don't know. Huh. Huh. Um, thank you. Thank you, Howard. Sure. Uh, Bill Clink, you are up. Thank you, Gary, and uh, thank you, Tom. Um, sure. I, I read that story in the book, and it's a good one. I'm really looking forward to the 89 series take that you've got. I That book on candlesticks is going to be a keeper. I got a couple articles I submitted for that as well. Okay. Um, but I was going to say to you, um, and Mars brought this to mind, uh, you know, much is made of, you know, the sight line and he couldn't see and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There was another problem that out of respect, the players covered for Willie. Um, I had a conversation with George the Stork Theodore, who uh -huh. was a defensive yep. replacement on that 73 team. And mm -hmm. he said they had a system. He did. Maybe Beecham and a few of the other defensive replacements did too, where when Willie caught a ball and there were runners on base, uh, Beecham, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Theodore would immediately run over near him and Mays would flip him the ball because okay. Mays dead he yeah. recognized that and a lot of times it was done so quickly that a lot of people didn't pick up on what was going on and right. you know theodore had got it in i don't know if theodore got assist on that but you know it, the players really you know tried to cover you can't do anything about the sun but when Mays's arm and it well didn't... he he never really recovered from that right shoulder that he dan you know i mean like i said he never played the rest of the season and I think it was still ailing him when the series, you know, the, the playoffs and the series came. Yeah. So not, that doesn't surprise me what you're saying. You know. Thanks again. They, I'm looking yeah. forward to your articles in the Gamble Stick book. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Bill. Storm and Norman Coleman. Norman. Um, Tom, before the meeting today, a lot of us were griping about the current state of the Giants. <laughs> and I just have to say that you reminded us about how lucky we are that we're Giants fans. So thank you very much for the presentation. That's no it. problem. Well, you've won more, you know, you've won your championships. You know, the Mets, it's like every 16 years we might have a chance. Oh, you waited 50 years to get one. <laughs> not not with the coneheads. Does anybody yeah. else have a question for Tom who has not asked for? There's a phone number there. I, I I saw it lighting up, so I don't know if they had a question. Seven one eight. Gary, maybe I just ask one question. Ed, go ahead, when, man. The the uh, when we're talking about uh, Yogi and uh, mm -hmm. uh, having to keep Willie on the roster, was there an expanded twenty five man roster then that it might not have been a problem? You know, I don't think so, because there a no, if there was, it was never talked about in any of the newspaper articles. It was always about who was gonna be released, if anybody, you know, especially after they um, made the trade for him, you know, what player was maybe gonna be released or, you know. Um, I thought it was like 27 after September yeah. or something like that. I don't know if that was in place back then. Oh. I know it, I think it's in place, you know, I don't think it was quite, I don't think so back no. in the, okay. the 70s. That, that came wrong. later, that came later. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, uh, Hindi, come on, end this for us. That's talk. Hey, Hindi, that. talk. Hello? 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 Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, who is this? Hey, it's uh, Dennis Cliffs. 
How are you? Oh, Dennis, how are you? Go ahead. Gary. Good, fine. Yeah, I, I, I was at the game. Uh, I was 25 years old. I was there with my fiance at the time and my dad, who may be a giant fan. He also loves Carl Hubble. And uh, I, 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 you know, we've all lost our parents and our grandparents, but I never, uh, I never cried as much as I did that night. In fact, I remember removing myself from my dad and my uh, girlfriend because I wanted to be uh, alone. And uh, there were 50,000 people with me, but I was by myself. And uh, it was just, uh, I still think about that day. And of course, his line about saying goodbye to America was uh, yep. genius as, as he was. And uh, I'm a, kind of a blunt person. So I think uh, Yogi Berra should have been uh, punched in the face for not getting Willie really Mays into the game. Uh, his last game on the seventh game of the World Series. It was the most disgraceful thing I've ever seen. Uh, to not, he could have just brought him into play center field and then acknowledged the crowd who would have gone nuts in Oakland and then taken him out of the game. But uh, he was too stupid. So, But it doesn't diminish one iota from uh, the greatness and the uniqueness uh, no. of this man. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Des. Tom, again... Thank you so much. And Tom, Tom's entry is in this great new book on maize. Yeah. Tom, please don't be a stranger. And when the candlestick book comes out, hopefully you come back and uh, talk about your entry. Sure. I'll be glad to. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to hang around here. Uh, if anybody wants to hang around and talk about uh, giant baseball. If not, we will <laughs> see each other next uh, Thursday with uh, a, a talk on Bobby Thompson. Good night, everybody. You have a good one. I'm going to go check on the mess. All right. Be good. That's the closing one.